Uh, <clears throat> my lords, it's a privilege to follow the no noble lord, and I rise as one of the few speakers from the Conservative benches uh, who neither is now nor ever has been a visiting professor, professor um, or uh, an honorary fellow at a distinguished uh, academic uh, institution. Uh, I, I, I started this debate with quite an open mind, my lords, but listening carefully to the speeches opposite, I've been persuaded to give wholehearted support um, to the bill. Um, first of all, it's not about a student protest. When I was uh, president of the Oxford Union many, many years ago, I had the privilege of welcoming the former president, Richard Nixon, to give um, an afternoon lecture. The, the, the demonstration was absolutely huge, carefully supervised by the local police and monitored by the US Secret Service. Um, and indeed, I welcomed that. The, the size of the demonstration was indeed a measure of the success uh, of the event, even more than the packed students, packed numbers inside, uh, with the demonstration outside showed that you really sort of hit the button. So I'm not trying to say stop student protest, and nor is this bill trying to stop student protest. Instead, my lords, I think, to understand the thrust of this bill, it's helpful to start with what I think is uh, one of the most perceptive quotations, one of my favourite quotations, uh, from the late Lord um, Keynes, Keynes. Um, um, uh, and since this is a debate of learned quotations, I hope noble lords will forgive me if I read it to them, which is that practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. Uh, indeed, I, I say as an aside to the Right Reverend Prelate Bishop of Coventry that the whole debate around the Reformation was in, eff in effect uh, framed by the academic uh, scribbler he referred to, St. Augustine of Hippo, some 1,100 years earlier and was still being worked out uh, by the rather overexcited interpretation of those um, writings by um, uh, a junior academic at a recently founded university lost in the uh, forests of eastern Germany uh, at the time. Uh, so the point I want to make is that academic thought has a real influence on social change, even if the time lag, as Lord Keynes said, a few years, might be a few decades, even though the time lag is very very significant, and that's a really important point to take hold of. And, and to take it a, f a step further, taking their guidance from a contemporary of Keynes in the shape of Antonio Gramsci, um, activists are very tempted to recognising this, to seek to capture that academic podium precisely because of its long-term influence, and in doing so, to seek to deny it to others. And that, my lords, is exactly what many of us feel has been happening in our universities over the last decades. Um, I'm not going to, because of the shortage of time, I'm not going to list examples, because the noble Lord, Lord MacDonald of River Glaven, um, the noble Baroness, Lady Fox of Buckley, and others have given many examples both of incidents and of changes in attitude which illustrate what I think is going on and what is such a deep cause of concern to many of us. Uh, noble lords on the opposite benches have said repeatedly that these incidents, these, are, these incidents they admit are objectionable, but these incidents are very, very rare. But my lords, it isn't the frequency of the events we should be looking at, but their egregiousness. Indeed, their rarity could be taken as an example, as proof, as evidence of the success of the policy that I have mentioned being pursued. Because, of course, as, another, uh, as other noble lords, as, as the Lady, uh, Lady Fox of Buckley has said, the punishment is the process. And as the noble lord, Lord Johnson of Marylebone, said in relation to uh, Chinese influence, self-censorship is the response. So, of course, if the policy is being successful, you would expect them to be rare. That, that in itself proves nothing at all. Um, this bill uh, is an attempt to try 
to rectify the balance in all of that. Um, uh, while it is probably inevitably ham-fisted, it nonetheless deserves our support in principle, though it may be capable of certain improvements. I would suggest, too, I was very struck by uh, the remark of the noble baroness Lady Fox of Buckley that we should address the plurality of objectives that we impose on universities, and, and a number of them were mentioned by the noble Lord Lord MacDonald of River Glavin. We should address them by trying to create some priority amongst them, that some are more important than others. And I would agree with the noble baroness that academic freedom should perhaps be put at the top of that tree as an overriding priority, not simply competing with lots of others, which both confuses the leadership of universities, uh, but equally makes it easy for those who wish to exploit the situation to escape by running round different competing priorities. And I think an amendment to that end would be very welcome and would provoke a very interesting debate. The second area where I think the bill is wholly silent and where I think an amendment would certainly provoke some interesting debate is in relation to funding, because the bill, as far as I can see, says nothing at all about the influence of funding on shaping academic debate and discussion and how capable it is of potential abuse. And I mean funding both within the university itself, but also funding, usually on a much larger scale, uh, from central funding councils, uh, making grants to support uh, various areas of research. And I think it might well be the case that we'd want to see amendments which would make that funding more transparent and show that, in fact, it was being... I'm not talking about funding flat earthers or, or, or people like that, but within the limits of a sensible academic debate, making sure that people are actually being funded in a balanced and sensible way. So I welcome the bill in terms of its uh, general principle, and I rather take the view, my lords, that it could be strengthened, and it would be a great mistake to try and oppose it on the basis that it's, you know, by digging into the weeds, we need to see the trees, we need to see the forest, and we need to understand what we need to do.